It's good to see you all this morning. This morning we find ourselves again in chapter 15 of the book of Romans. Today's title is Living in Unity. By looking over everybody graciously greeting each other and loving on each other this morning, this seems like I'm preaching to the choir. But unity is a very difficult thing because it involves sacrifice. It means I don't get everything the way I want it. And any time that you couple up with someone or get in a group of people and you become part of a team, you know that you're not going to have everything the way you want it. You guys know that, right? And that's where all the fun begins. And there can be all sorts of bitterness that arises, and there can be all sorts of rubs on, on one another, and then there's the, the lingering, yeah, you, you wait, you wait, I'll, I'll get you. Maybe I'm just remembering my own experiences. But unity can be a very difficult thing, and Christ came, died, and gave his life so that we might have unity with him and with one another. Amen? Amen. And boy, what a wonderful thing it is when people dwell together in unity and when everybody's on the same page and kind of see things the same way. And uh, that's, that's why we have uh, classes. We have membership classes, which we'll have one uh, after this service today. Uh, make sure that you see Carl. It's kind of hard not to see Carl. But... <laughs> You know what I mean. Let's pray. Father, we're in your word and we're grateful for it. I pray that you might open it up for us, that you might give me the right words to say, that your Holy Spirit might guide our minds and our hearts so we might hear from you. And that's why we're here. And Lord, because we are so many different individuals, we need your help to be one body. And I pray that you help us to understand your word and to have us to be willing to put those things into practice so that we might experience the fullness of joy that comes from knowing you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, so we are in chapter 15, which is right at the end of the application. So we're running to the end of the book of Romans pretty quickly. Because chapter 16 is kind of a prologue. It, it, it's a bunch of greetings that Paul gives to various people. And there are some things we'll look at there. But we're rapidly approaching the end of Romans. I thought there would be a cheer <laughs> that would go up. <laughs> chapter 15, verse 1. We then, who are strong, are to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus that you may be you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the Lord the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made by the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. 
Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a lot of stuff there. So I better go quickly. <laughs> Last week I pulled this passage up for you. Those who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses or the scruples of the weak. It's kind of an interesting, it, it sounds like a board game, doesn't it? What it is, is within the body of Christ, Paul is writing to the Romans. Now, there are a whole bunch of Gentiles who have then been included along with all of these other Jews. And they were looking at each other and judging each other by what kind of food they ate, what kind of, you know, liquor they're drinking, or, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. They're looking and they're looking down their nose at, at some of them and some of them are looking back up and saying, you know, what's your problem? You're all wound too tight. And this church had to get along, much like our church today. And, you know, there, there are people from all different backgrounds, all different socioeconomic, you know, everything here in our church. So how do you get a people like this to get along? Because you can't do it outside these walls. What it is, is we have a commitment to one another that when people are weak, we carry them. And those of us who are strong have the responsibility and the privilege to carry those who are weak. Now, that, that all sounds wonderful and heroic until you have to do it. And then it's like, why don't you get over yourself, man? What's wrong with you? <laughs> okay, maybe it's just me. I say those things, <laughs> and it's like, here, let me take you aside and educate you. And you see, that's what I want to do. I want to fix things. Men tend to be fixers. Ladies, can I get an amen? <laughs> Men tend to be fixers. You know, you're just pouring out your heart to your husband, and you're t I just want him to know how I feel. And he's like, okay, I got a, I got a three-step plan for you. It's like, no, 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 you missed it. Uh, I tend to be a fixer. If you have a problem, by golly, we can seek the Lord and get a solution. You know, let's get it done. But this says, those of us who are strong should bear with the scruples of the weak. It doesn't say you're supposed to fix them. It doesn't say you're supposed to educate them. It doesn't say you're supposed to disciple them into fullness of knowledge. You see, there were people eating meat that were sacrificed to an idol, and they had no conscience about it because the meat's good, it's cheap. You know, I got a good cut for 99 cents a pound. It's awesome. And then there were other people looking on and saying, oh, no, you're eating pork. Or somebody was drinking wine and there were people saying, he's drinking wine. This is what they were doing. And people still do that today. So the question is, what do we do? The Bible tells us that those of us who are strong, who know better, who can eat the meat and have no conscience, are supposed to say, well, I won't be eating today because of you. Because I don't want to offend your conscience. And I don't want to embolden you to do something that's going to cause you to do something that is basically sin for you to do between you and God because you shouldn't be eating that. It's like you eating an entire cheesecake in front of me. <laughs> that's going to stumble me. I just want to let you know that. So don't do that. So, but those of you who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses or the scruples of the weak, and not to please ourselves. You see, when you're in a body of believers, when you're in a family, when you're in a corporation, when you're in a body of believers, it's not all about you. It has to be about more than you. And God's will is not found in any one person's opinion. And you have to realize that God has gifted and given people insight to see the full spectrum of who God is, and we only see one little bit of that. And so we should bear with the weaknesses or the scruples of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For since Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So we're given Jesus Christ as the example of how we're to carry one another, those who, of us who are strong. Let it never be said that the church is the only group that shoots its wounded. Have you ever heard that statement? 
uh, you, you teach, your teacher needs to get better informed and tell you. Yes, there are people that say the church is the only group that actually shoots its wounded. You know, you did what? You, you fell, you stumbled, you, you're struggling with this, that, or the other thing? Well, you're out of the church, man. We're, we're going to disown you and, uh, you know, we're going to put you down. Poof. There are people that say that the church is the only group that does that. You would never do that of your wounded in the field if you were in the military. You would never do that in any other situation. If somebody was weak and, and, and not able to do things in your own home, you wouldn't neglect them, forget about them, and let them die in a corner. You wouldn't do it to a dog. And yet in the church, if we're not careful, we can get judgmental like these folks were and start pointing the finger at people and saying, well, it's not my job to carry you. So we who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. You know what a scruple is? <laughs> it's an infirmity or error arising from weakness of mind. You notice I'm not wearing a mask today. But some of you are wearing a mask. My job is to make sure that I don't infringe upon your personal space. Because I'm strong. And if I get sick a third time from COVID, I don't care. So that's why you're all wearing masks. It's my job to be sensitive to you. It's not my job to tell you, do you know that a mask is like a fence keeping out mosquitoes from your yard? You see, it's not my job to educate you. What it is, is it's my job to be sensitive to your needs. Not to get you on my page, but I get on your page. Amen? So those of us who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses or the scruples. And it's an infirmity or an error that's arising from a weakness of mind. There were folks who could not eat meat or drink wine because they felt it was a sinful, horrible, terrible thing. You're contributing, you're supporting an industry. You know, I've had experiences. I mean, my, my father and my brother died of alcohol. So what do you do about that? If we're going to be in a group and we have to be together, what you do is you actually defer to the weakest person out of love for Christ and love for them. So I don't ever want to do something that's going to cause somebody to stumble or be put out to a place where they're going to do something to, and embolden to do something that God's told them personally they should not do. So we bear with the infirmities of the weak. We see Jesus does this excellently, and he receives people unconditionally. Unfortunately, we don't tend to do that. I don't tend to do that sometimes. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says this, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. I, I remember this. It's a little like running into a burning building and you know somebody's in that building and you look and you search for them and you find them and then very delicately you pick them up because they might be burned, they might be injured, they might have broken bones and you get them the heck out of there as best as you can knowing that you yourself might get trapped in that thing. Make sense? And so we bear the infirmities of the week by going in and rescuing and doing what we can to help. And we bear the burdens of one another. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. That, that means a building up or a growth of someone else. So whenever we speak to anyone, it should always be for the benefit of the person we're speaking to. That's hard to do, isn't it? You find it all easy to do? I want to start a wave. I want to start... I, I, I want to just get you all to move because you're all like... <laughs> mannequins. I'm glad. We're stunned by your wisdom. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's on the page. When I speak, I need to consider my audience. I need to consider who I'm speaking to. I need to consider how I'm going to say something to you. I need to consider what is it that the Lord wants me to say to you. 
all of these things instead of, I got to say something. <laughs> well, just because you got to say something doesn't mean you got to say something. You don't, you don't have to say anything. You should say that which the Lord would have you say. And if you do that, then it's going to be good for the person you're speaking to. It's going to be like food, mental, emotional, spiritual food, so that the people can grow. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth except what is good and for necessary edification or building up or growth, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So when you speak, do people pick up on grace or do they pick up on legalism? Do they pick up on grace or do they pick up on the law? There's a way to even reprove somebody gracefully and in gentleness, correct them. Jesus always did this. Everyone that he spoke to, he told them exactly what they needed to hear. It wasn't about what he was pushing that day, some you know, pet theory that he wanted to, everybody to know about. He spoke to individuals and he spoke directly to their need. I think about the calling of Nathaniel here in uh, John 1 verses 45 to 50. It says, Philip, who was already called by Jesus, found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. By the way, that's a good thing to tell unbelievers, right? Come and see. I don't know about this Jesus. Come and see. Open up the pages and read. Why don't you come to church with me? Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he says, from now on, you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the son of man. Here's the thing. Nathaniel was doing something under the tree that had something to do with him saying, here's a guy who's got no deceit. And Jesus caught him. How do you know me? Well, I saw you when you were under the tree. You are the son of God. Like, he could have been walking by and saw him under the tree, right? <laughs> and Jesus said, so you're amazed at that, huh? Oh, wait till you see what else is going to happen. Jesus knew exactly what to say to him because the spirit of God filled him. You can say exactly what it is that God wants you to say to somebody because the Spirit of God is in you. So whenever I speak to somebody, I want to be conscious, Lord, what is it you want them to know? And can you use me? Because sometimes you're unusable, right? Sometimes people just won't listen to you, especially if you're too close. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. You tell your kids something and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a total stranger tells them and they're like, that's profound. <laughs> It happens when you're married too. <laughs> but I will move on. Let each of us please, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification or building up. In Philippians 2, we're given the example of Jesus Christ. says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, which is me, me, me-ism. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's why... I parked two blocks away. That's why Carl parks two blocks in that direction over at the school. That's why you didn't see anybody in the parking lot until those of you who are a little bit less mobile started be showing up. And there were people who parked your cars for you. Because we consider you more important than us. And that's a biblical thing to do is consider other people more important than you. You know, instead of rushing to the best, you know, the best seat at the table, it's like the opposite of musical chairs. 
if, everybody, if there were a bunch of Christians playing musical chairs, the music should stop and they'd be, no, no, you can have my chair. No, you can. <laughs> it would be no fun. There's no avarice. There's no greed. But you get the idea. And what does that communicate? It communicates love, doesn't it? And that you don't need somebody patting you on the back because God already has approved of you and sent a son to die for you. And he loves you. And because you're so full of that love, you don't, you don't need other people to like you. But because you are loved by God, you love people. It's a cause and effect that's a little reversed from the world. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He didn't think equality with God was something to be held on to. But being, form in, being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself even to death and death on the cross. So have this mind in you where other people are more important. And I'm not going to say anything unless it's good for you to hear. Maybe it's that you need a Tic Tac. <laughs> because you need to hear about that. Because I care about everyone else you're going to talk to. So what does it look like? It, it looks like a... Musical chairs, it's no fun. It means that we're always looking, looking for the Lord to use us in the lives of other people. When you came into church, did you think, Lord, who do you want me to talk to? Who needs a hug? Who needs to be encouraged? It means that you're always looking and you're praying as you're looking and being sensitive, that you're listening when people say something. You know, say, hey, how you doing this morning? I'm okay. No, you're not. You're, hey, you're not okay. What's going on with that? Well, I got to talk to you. Okay, there we go. There's the, you know, they open up the, the, the giant door of their heart, and that's important. It means that you're living. When you're concerned about other people, you're careful that you're a good example and that you're not setting a bad example, right? You won't find me up here picking my nose and, you know, scratching spots. <laughs> you're naturally thoughtful that you are setting an example for everybody around you. And if you have children, oh my goodness. Children pick up everything. They're like word magnets. And we have a little 18 month running around at home, uh, old at home, uh, our grandson. And he's, he just picks up all kinds of words now. He's just, you say a word, I say amazing. He goes, hey. Yeah. He just picks these things up. I can only imagine parents that prolifically curse having their children mimic them from the back seat in their chair, you know. Um, I've met some of those kids. And it's, uh, it, it's it, you know, you put it on YouTube, it's funny. But, you know, these kids grow up that way. Or they learn how to have a bad temper and lose their temper. Or they always, always, always get their way because that's what they've been taught. And you go, oh my goodness, what a terrible example they must have had. And, you know, sometimes it's just sin in their own hearts. But be careful because as we're living, we're always an example of what, what we think other people should do. Giving. As you give to people, when you find people that have needs, whatever those needs are, that means that you're thinking more of them than you are you because it's your stuff after all, right? It's your finances, it's your stuff, it's your time, it's your effort. And when you give that away, it's, it, you, there's a piece of you that goes with it, right? So we're always thoughtful of other people in the way that we give. Speaking, don't let any uncontaminated word, anything that comes out of your mouth that would be unhelpful proceed from your mouth. And so as we're speaking, I want to say those things in the right way that you'll receive it and understand it, which means I have to do some work because I have to unlearn a lot of bad habits. Serving, taking care of it. So, you know, somebody just arbitrarily drops something and you bend down to pick it up because you still can bend down. My wife has this thing. I remember my shoe was untied and I went to tie it and she just, boom, she dropped to one knee and she tied my shoe. And I was like, this is weird. <laughs> but she does that for everybody. So if you have an untied shoe and walk by my wife, she'll, she'll drop to a knee and she'll, she'll tie your shoe. Um, you could try that. That'd be fun. 
But in our serving, we want to think about others and think about maybe what they're able to do, what they're not able to do, and how it is that the Lord might use you to fill the gap and to do that. Also in sacrificing, there are things that you give up, like a weekend or some hours of time or whatever. And we give those things up willingly because we love people. But without the love of God in our hearts, without walking in the spirit, we're just going to be selfish. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know, I don't know about you, I'm not one of those guys who wakes up first thing in the morning and my eyes go bink, and I'm, hallelujah, Jesus, I'm so glad to be alive. Thank you for waking me up for another day. I, that's not natural for me. What's natural for me is I have to find the edge of the bed. And I have to throw the covers off because I'm a little frustrated. And I have to use my foot to push myself off the stinking bed. And I drop down and I'm finally planted. Then I say, okay, here we go. It takes me a while. That's why I get here before all of you. I need more time to warm up. But there are sacrifices that we make for other people. You know, there's a good way to do that and a really bad way to do that. You could get the whole martyr complex. You don't, you've never heard of this. Okay, this is a martyr complex. Well, you're not going to eat that food? Well, you know, I slaved over a hot stove all day. <laughs> See, that's a martyr complex where you throw guilt on somebody else and you're a martyr. Or... You know, somebody says, hey, listen, can I borrow $5? What'd you do with the $5 I gave you seven weeks ago? <laughs> That's a martyr complex, okay? Where you've got it so bad and the person has no right to actually ask you to do anything for them. That's a martyr complex. But Jesus stooped and washed feet. Dirty, open toe, sandaled, walking on dirt roads with animals dropping at will feet. And it was after the meal, when everyone ate. By the way, this was the Last Supper. You may have heard of it. We just celebrated it. It was after supper. Jesus, usually you wash your feet because your, your feet are in the face of the guy next to you because they're all reclined at coffee table height. And nobody washed their feet. Jesus saw a need. You know what he did? He got up and he got it done. He took his clothes off first and wrapped himself with a towel so he wouldn't mess up his clothes. That tells you how dirty the feet were. Jesus stooped and washed feet. Why can't we do that? When was the last time you washed my feet? That's why I keep my feet clean. This could happen at any point. We have to be deliberate and intentional to be God's hands, feet, and voice to others. It's one of these things that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you've given him your life, it is a deliberate, intentional mindset that you have to have. Or else you know what happens? Entropy. You become selfish. You walk in the flesh. It's just about you. It's about, let me see, what do I want now? I think I want a drink. What would I like to drink? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a little something, a little, you know, a little good news, a little something. I, I, I want a little, I'm kind of hungry, I'm a little nashy. It's all about you. It's all about whatever your next appetite is, what your next desire is, and you don't think about anybody but yourself. How many of you tend to go that direction? Four or five of us. Okay, all right, good. I'm not the only one. What it looks like is a, a looking, listening, living, giving, speaking, serving, sacrificing, intentional stance before God. Lord, lead me by your spirit and help me to do what you would have me do because if I just do what I want to do, that life is miserable and empty. Amen? Amen? Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And we have Jesus as an example. And everything that he did, I remember when he was in the garden, and he said, Father, I pray that this cup could pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus didn't even do what he wanted to do. Okay, he didn't want to die. He didn't want to go to the cross, and he knew what that meant being separated from his father and, and literally going to hell and being killed and murdered on a cross and dying. He knew more than any of us do what that was. And he did it willingly for you. If you were the only one, he would have done it for you. First John 4, 11 and 12 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. It's a very interesting passage. When you read through it, you, there's kind of a speed bump in the middle of it. It's, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. I get that. No one has ever seen God at any time. What? Why is that in there? If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. You see, no one has ever seen God before until you can show them. You can show them love, the love of God, and they will see God in you. Do you see that? You know, you can pray for people, which we should do, but why not be a demonstration of God's love to them by carrying their burdens? By How can I pray for you? It's one of the greatest things. We're going to be going out and knocking on doors and reintroducing ourselves to the neighborhood and letting people know who we are and inviting them out to church. And one of the greatest things that I've, I've learned to make a habit is when we go and do that, ask somebody, hey, is there something that we could pray for you about? And it's amazing how people just open up. We had, a, we had a guy that was like, nah, 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 nah. We said, hey, listen, is there anything that we can do to pray for you? And he walked over and sunk his head into the ground, and he began to weep. The guy was, nah, 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 nah. And then suddenly he walked over and he began to weep, and he says, pray for my daughter. And he began to share what was going on. And we laid hands on him and we prayed for him and told him that we'd be around. And, and he had to like sniffle and, and walk away and went back to his thing. But you know what? There, something happened there. We showed him the love of God. No one has seen God at any time, but when we show love, we show people God's love. And they get to see just a little piece of who God is. So, so show others God in you which is what I believe that that passage says. No one's ever seen God unless you're going to be loving towards him, and then guess what? They've seen him. They've seen him in you. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached me, reproached you, fell on me. If you think about it, when Jesus came, all of what he suffered was because of your sin, because of my sin. He demonstrated what it is to carry a weak one's burdens because Jesus did that. It says here in John 8, 28, Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Jesus said he doesn't do anything of his own accord. He does what the Father tells him to do. Boy, wouldn't it be good if you could put that on your tombstone? Your lives are deep. Always did what God wanted him to do. I couldn't think of anything better. It'd be a lie. But it wasn't of him. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. You see, being a Christian doesn't mean that you get a golden ticket and then you can go about your life, do whatever you want, and you've got entrance into heaven like some concert ticket that's going to happen in the future. What it means is you become a follower of Jesus Christ, which means I give up my life because he gave up his life for me, and I'm going to take on his character. I'm going to allow his spirit to fill me so it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. In Mark 10, 43 to 44, Jesus said, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be the slave of all. Jesus demonstrated this. So it wasn't just he's telling us to do something and he himself didn't do it. He demonstrated what that is. And he was God in, in human flesh. And if he could do that, we can do that, right? Amen. By his power, we can. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. You realize that everything that's written in the scriptures was written for us. It's written for you. That's what it says. These things were written for our learning so that we might have an understanding of what's happening. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 to 10, we're given another reason these things are written. Now, these things became our examples 
to the, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. That's in Numbers 25.3. And do not become idolaters as some of them. And as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's in Exodus 32.6. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Everything that happened in the scriptures is for our learning, if we'll learn it. It'll be for your mocking if you don't learn it, and then you read it and you go, oh, I wish I read this before. I wouldn't have done the stupid thing that I did. But it's for our learning. And that's, I don't know about you, but it's one of the hardest things to do is to actually put time aside, get in the word and spend time with God, which is one of the most enriching and wonderful things we can do in our lives. And it's so hard to do. Why is it? Because we're selfish. You know, it's a beautiful day outside. I should be outside. I should be running. I should be walking. I should be driving. I should be eating. I should be doing something. I don't, I don't have time. to. You know, you got to open the book. I mean, that's hard. That's the way we are. A proper hermeneutic. Here's the, the Bible says that these things are for our learning and for our warning so that we don't do the things that we would otherwise do. And the more that you look, the more that you learn. How many of you are amazed at the depth of the word of God? I am amazed at the depth of the word of God. And every time you read it, it seems to say something different because it applies differently to your heart. God is so good that way. It means that the Bible was written to you as a personal letter. These things happened because these people were boneheads, so you don't have to be. So don't waste it. Right? Learn. Verse 5, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Isn't that a, an awesome prayer? That's actually a, a little benediction in the middle of this, this passage. He talks about how we need to be like-minded towards one another. And he's talking to a bunch of people who have been pressed together, who come from different traditions and different religious understandings and different persuasions and convictions, just like us. And he says, I pray that God would help you to be like-minded. But that usually means that we have to be deliberate and intentional about it. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. In a spiritual sense, Jesus was wealthy beyond belief, and he gave it all up so that you could have it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Paul says in another place, To the Jews, I'm a Jew. To the Gentiles, I'm a Gentile. Whoever it is I'm talking with, I identify with them. You're a Jew? Hey, me too. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was a Pharisee, and I know the scriptures, you know, and he's connecting. And why does he do that? So that he might win them to Christ. When he's talking to somebody who's not under the law, he goes, me too. I'm not under the law. I'm a Jew, but I'm not under the law. Well, how's that work? Let me explain it to you. That's what Paul does. He does what he can. He does all that he can to make sure that he doesn't offend somebody. You know, somebody says, well, I'm a Gentile. Well, I'm a Jew. <laughs> you instantly have a separation. Or somebody says, oh, well, I'm a Jew. And you go, well, I'm not under the law. I don't have to do what it says. There's a way you can be antagonistic and, and rebellious 
And you're not trying to win people to Christ. You're not deliberately, intentionally trying to be of one mind and trying to win them to, the, you know, to Christ. So, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. In other words, don't do all the stupid things I do. Do all the good things that I do that are like Jesus. That's a good thing, right? I don't want you to imitate everything I do. But you can imitate the things that are Christ-like. That's, that's good. Therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Don't you find it amazing that we are accepted by God as we are, and he loves us as we are? But he loves us so much, he won't leave us as we are. I think it's one of the greatest things about God's love. I think about the adulterous woman that was thrown at his feet in John chapter 7, and he sided with her. He showed acceptance for her. He validated her. Even though she was in sin, and he said so. He said, well, where are your accusers? Well, there are none. Well, then neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more, which means he knows what kind of life she was living. But do you see how he accepted her? How is it I can't accept somebody else who knows and loves the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus can accept a complete and utter sinner like that. Or I think about Zacchaeus, who was up the tree in Luke 19. Zacchaeus was a Jewish man who basically forsook his people and worked for the Romans for the money he would get. And they were known to be criminals and help themselves and fill their pockets with other people's money. And Zacchaeus is all curious about Jesus coming by, and he's a short little dude, so he climbs a tree. And Jesus comes by and says, hey, Zacchaeus, you got to get down from there. Yeah, no kidding. He's going to break his neck. No, nah, we're going to your house for, for dinner today. He was doing all this so that he might get a, a, just a glimpse of Jesus. And here Jesus invited himself over for lunch. Do you see, Jesus didn't mock him up in the tree. He didn't make fun of him up in the tree. He didn't say, you're a filthy, rotten sinner. He didn't have to. He showed him love and acceptance, and he repented, which is what we should do. Or you think about the centurion who comes to Jesus and in chapter 8 of Matthew, and he says, listen, uh, I have a servant at home who's sick, and I'd like you to come and heal him. This is a centurion. He's in charge of 100 guys. He's a military leader. He's somebody that will bust you up. And these are the folks that inhabited Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem wasn't their hometown. And Jesus said, okay, let's go. And he goes, no, no, no. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. You just, you know, you, you tell it, you, you, you just speak it from here. It'll happen, I believe. You know, I'm a man who's also under authority. I tell this one to go, he goes. I tell this one to come, he comes. And he goes, you know, I haven't found anybody with faith like that in all of Israel. There's nobody that believes me like that. And he goes, according to your faith, it's done. And he goes back and it's his servant. It's not even his child, it's his servant. This guy has a giant heart for one of his servants to go and ask a Jewish rabbi to come and heal and Jesus accepted him, just as he was. He didn't say, okay, listen, we've got to get a couple things down. Number one, you've got to get baptized, okay? Number two, you've got to fill out this application, you know. It's a multi-page, you know, thing. No, he accepted him, and he granted his request, just like that, because of his faith. I think about the Syrophoenician woman who comes to Jesus and, and says, please come, my child is demon-possessed. And he says, well, listen, lady, it's not right to give the children's food to the dogs. He was saying, you're not even Jewish. I'm, a Jew I'm the Jewish Messiah. I'm a, I'm a Jewish rabbi. And you're coming to me asking me for a favor? It's not right to take the food that's supposed to go on the, the plates of my children and give it to the dogs. Do you catch she's calling her a dog? And she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. You see, she said, what I'm asking you is a small thing compared to who you are. 
You see the faith of this woman? And Jesus gave her exactly what she asked for. Jesus receives all of these characters, and I find it hard to forgive the people that are closest to me. I don't feel anything like a Christian. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. For you are all sons of God through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. The way that we judge people usually is on appearance or where they're from or their nationality or, their, or how much money they make. Or, and we tend to change the way that we treat them. You know, we, somebody that can't give us much, well, ah, we can ignore that person. But people that mean like your boss or, or somebody that's important to you, you, you got to be nice to them because if you're not nice to them, they won't give you a raise. So you put on the plastic smile. And... That's the way of the world. That's not the way of the church. Amen. The way of the church is I, I, I'm going to show love universally. And I don't care who you are. And yeah, I'm going to spend time with you and I'm going to have a conversation with you. I'm not going to give you the bums rush and say, listen, listen, I'm busy. Okay? I got to go. If I ever do that, smack me. Now, I say to you that Jesus Christ has become the servant of the circumcision. Now, he's talking about Gentiles. He's not talking about an operation. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Paul is now going to go into four passages from the Old Testament to say, by the way, all of you Jewish people, these Gentiles were invited into the church. It's not an abnormality. It's not just a temporary fling. It's not just the style of the season for these Gentiles to drop in and be a follower of Jesus Christ. These folks were invited by God. And here, let me show you. And he goes back into the Old Testament to these four. Because these, these outsiders, new believers, these immature, they can be a great distraction to us in the church and can be an occasion for distraction, judgment, stumbling, and resentment. Just remember, they are his invited guests. It doesn't matter who comes in the door of this place. They're guests of Jesus Christ. Do you treat them that way? I don't know about you, but I get, I get a little excited. I see a guest. I'm like, oh, I don't know them. I think I'll go overwhelm them. That's not my plan, but that's usually what happens. But they're his invited guests. We should see people as that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10, 20 to 22. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. It means that you all agree in what you're saying. And that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, you're calling, brethren, that not many were wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things, that's you and me, in the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things, the low things, you know, friends in low places, the base things of the world, that the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are 
that no flesh should glory in his presence. When God picks a team, he picks all the oddballs. Amen. So it doesn't matter how odd you are, you're in good company. There are not many of us who are wealthy. There are not many of us who are well-known. There are not many of us that are professional anythings. Not many. I'm not, I didn't say not any. Some of you are. Not me. I'm still trying to figure out how to do this. People are either his children or they're his invited guests, and that's how we should see them. For this reason, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. All of these Old Testament passages speaking about the Gentiles is not an us and them mentality. It's they are going to come because of the Jews. By the way, did you realize that Christianity is based on the, on the formidable foundation of the Old Testament and the Messiah who is to come to the Jews? We are included and grafted into this wonderful tree because of Jesus Christ. By faith, praise God. So there's not all this genuflecting and stuff that we have to do. And we were always designed by God to be invited to the table. So if there's anybody that would walk through that door, they're invited to the table as well. It doesn't matter where they come from or what their background is. Ephesians 2, 14 and 15 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, speaking of Gentile and Jew, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in the flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Jesus came, died, came for the chosen people. They then rejected him, and the Gentiles were ushered in to believe in a Messiah that was not ours. What a blessing that is. He himself is our peace. It doesn't matter who it is you think you have enmity with or you have, you're going to be an enemy with. You don't need to be. Christ has taken down that wall. And there's a solution. It's called Jesus Christ. And he's the one who makes us all one. Without him, we would, we would just be devouring each other like the rest of the world. Verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is called a benediction. Uh, bene meaning, meaning good, and diction meaning words. So these are good words. It's a benediction. Now may the, may, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace. That's a good prayer. Pray that for me. That the God of hope would fill me with joy and peace in believing. That's something that is evidence of the Holy Spirit, by the way. When that's in your life, you know God's working in your life. With the absence of that, you begin to wonder. That you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what it is to abound in hope? Hope is like Christmas Eve. You're a kid, and you go to bed, and the tree's up. And you know your parents aren't going to bed for a long time because there's stuff that needs to be put together. And they tell you to go to bed, but you can't sleep because you know tomorrow's Christmas. <laughs> there's going to be stuff for you. That's hope. It's not, oh, I hope, I hope there's food left when I go out there. It's not that. That's not hope. That's a wish. That's different. Hope is a future certainty, like Mark said today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Christmas Eve. It's not going to be long until we go home. Amen. There are those who have predeceased us and they're there waiting. And we'll see them. It's Christmas. May God fill you with joy 
and peace as we focus on the hope of eternity because of what Jesus Christ has done. And it's by the Holy Spirit that it's given. It's not something you manufacture or you can, you know, you can force yourself into. It's something that God will do for you, and he wants to. One more passage, Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice that's something that we have to do. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I would exhort you guys to live a life that is worthy of your calling. We have been called to such a love. God has loved us so immeasurably. And he gives us the baton, and he says, I want you to do that for one another, as he leaves us an example. In all lowliness of mind, in all gentleness, pray for me, because I need some of that. And I'll pray for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the ideal that you have put in the scriptures. I thank you for the exhortation and for the hope that we can have to know that you will do these things if we are willing. I pray that you help us to lay down our lives, that we would take our selfish minds and our selfish desires and put them aside, Lord, and allow you to reign in us, for you to rule us, for you to help us to be mindful of other people, that we might be more thoughtful of others than we are of ourselves. Pray that you might inspire us by your Holy Spirit with joy and peace that we would be able to do that by the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.